So great to have all of you here this evening. Thank you for joining for our intersect service. Let us begin. Whoever you are, whatever your age, race, place in life, you are welcome here today. Young and old, those at peace, those who are struggling, the well off, those in need. Liberals and conservatives, believers and seekers, all are welcome. We come together today in unity, putting aside our differences and seeking to intersect with one another and our Creator. At the intersection of the cross, we find unity in Jesus Christ. I forgot to mention one thing. So I have had a close exposure to COVID. I tested negative. It's nine days. I am asymptomatic. But under medical advice, I am keeping my mask on this evening, so bear with me and preach with a mask on. Did it this morning, it was okay, but I just thought I'd mention that. That's why the mask is staying on tonight. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Oh God, what a privilege it is to gather to worship your name. And we do come this evening and seek your blessing. We seek to connect with you to feel the touch of your presence, the breath of your Holy Spirit, we pray that each person joining in this worship service would feel the presence of God, to have your word written upon our hearts, and that you would meet us here this evening. We give you this time of praise and worship in the matchless name of the one who is to come, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like you to stand and join in singing our first song here in Act to Worship.
be the Lord who is worthy of our worship this evening. Please join me in this prayer. Almighty, everlasting God, let our prayer in your sight be as it is in us, the lifting up of our hands as the evening sacrifice. Give us grace to behold you present in your word and sacraments. Stir up in us the flame of that love which burned in the heart of your Son as he bore his passion. And let it burn in us to eternal life and to the ages of ages. We are in the season of Advent as we seek and look for the coming of the Lord. Sing this next song as a prayer, asking our Messiah to come, the Lord Jesus. <laughs> to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? And he said to them, 
Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is come. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his grain. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, open your word to us in this time. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Right. As Christmas 2007 was approaching, the Wally family was preparing to move. Nearly all of our possessions were in boxes. We would be leaving just after Christmas to make the journey from Hilton Head Island to our new home in Gladstone, New Jersey. And since our Christmas decorations were in boxes and we weren't leaving until after Christmas, I went to look for a simple way that we could have a Christmas tree. And I found the perfect solution at Walmart. And so I purchased that. <laughs> that is a fiber optic Christmas tree. Now don't laugh, but I have taken great joy in my fiber optic Christmas tree these past 14 years, despite the fact that certain family members make fun of me for it. <laughs> Do you know how this works? It's got one ball, just one ball, and then a colored disc that spins above the ball. The light travels through the fiber optic cables to produce twinkling colors on the branches. This tree is so easy to put up, all you have to do is put down the base, plug it in, and plop the tree down in the stand, and voila! You have a fully operational Christmas tree. Now that tree not only fulfilled our purpose that year, I put it up in the family room every year since, though we do put up another large, more complicated tree in the living room. And the strands of light on that one have shorted and needed to be replaced more than once since we moved to New Jersey. But my fiber optic tree has worked perfectly these past 14 years. I haven't even had to replace the bulb. Think about it. Things that last and things that don't. Where are electric typewriters, 8-track tape players, floppy disks that were once all the rage. They're gone, just like steam-powered automobiles and rotary dial telephones. What things have lasted the test of time in your household? What things have not? In our world, there are things that last and things that don't. And that is exactly what the holy disruptor John the Baptist comes to remind us of on this third Sunday of Advent. In our reading from Luke chapter 3 this evening, he unsettles us with this abrupt, harsh, and direct wording, warning us that there are things that will last and things that will pass away. Only John isn't talking about eight track tape players or fiber optic Christmas trees. He isn't concerned with stuff at all. When John speaks about these things that will last and things that will not, he's speaking about our very lives. I must tell you that as I was preparing this sermon, I kept trying to preach on one of the other passages assigned today, Philippians 4. It's one of my favorites. I love those words that are used in the final blessing that I say every Sunday. The peace of God that passes all understanding. But as I prayed and asked God to guide me and what to say to you this evening, the sermon that came through just wouldn't come from Philippians 4. Instead, I was kind of surprised at what was drawing my attention. 
And it was these words of John the Baptist. The axe is already at the root of the tree. So hold on as we take a wild ride with the fiery prophet this evening and consider what the axe of God is cutting down. Did you notice this intense, scary language of John the Baptist in our reading? Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then a little later, speaking of Jesus, John says, He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor, to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And then the most striking thing of all, after all of that, Luke ends this passage by saying, So, with many other exhortations, he, that's John the Baptist, proclaimed the good news to the people. Good news? How is God's axe cutting down trees and throwing them into the fire? Jesus separating the good grain from the worthless chaff that gets burned with unquenchable fire. How is that good news? How is the axe at the root of the tree good news? Look with me at what John says is being chopped down, cut from our lives, and thrown into the fire. First, reliance on family heritage and religious affiliation. These will not last. The first century Jews listening to John the Baptist were confident that they were right with God because they were Jewish. Their ancestry, their lineage, their race, they believed they were God's chosen people. They were relying on their family and empty religious practices. Not that valuing family and having fine religious traditions are bad things, mind you, but they were trusting in those things. They were taking what should have been good means to an end and making them the end. The religious practice of family ancestry could be helpful means of drawing hearts closer to God. They were potentially good means to the end, but instead, the people made those things the goal. They thought, just show up for worship, follow the rules, take pride in your family that you've come from, trust in those things, and you will be all right. But John says the axe is already at the root of the tree. Those things are being chopped down. They will not last. Second, second thing being chopped down. As John speaks to the tax collectors, he says, they say, they come to John and they say, what should we do? And John says, not, he doesn't say, you know, go get another more reputable job. He says, stop collecting more than you're supposed to collect. This is, of course, what most ancient tax collectors did. Because the more they could collect above what the Roman government was exacting in taxes, they got to keep. They were padding their pockets by oppressing the people, taking advantage of others for personal gain. All that money you got, you aren't taking any of it with you, John says. That's passing away. It won't last. The axe is already at the root of the tree. Third. The soldiers ask, what should we do? And John says, don't abuse the authority of your position to extort from others. Don't wield the power you have to personal advantage at the cost of the well-being of others. Power unjustly gained will not last. Oppressing people with authoritarian power will not last. The axe is already at the root of the tree. You see, people then as now, get so focused on the wrong things, on things that won't last. People then, as now, spend so much time and effort on gathering up things for themselves, on accumulating stuff, accumulating power, relying on religiosity, or trusting in their own family heritage. But John says those things will not last. They're passing away. The axe is already at the root of the tree. Like those who trusted in having Abraham as their father, we too can easily fall into thinking that because my family is Christian, I am Christian, and therefore right with God. Or we can think because I go to church every Sunday, or because I'm a good Episcopalian, 
It makes me right with God. But those things are the means to the end, not the end in themselves. They will pass away. The axe is already at the root of the tree. And like the tax collector, we too can get focused on material possessions and all the luxury which money can buy, that new car, that bigger house, that nice vacation, won't last. That new dress, that diamond necklace, that prestigious club membership, they won't last. Have they found yours yet? What things of this world are you spending time and energy pursuing? They won't last. The ax is already at the root of the tree. And like a soldier, we can get fixated on governmental power and working politics to our own personal advantage. We can turn a blind eye to injustice, discrimination, or oppression, or even participate in them ourselves when it works to our advantage. We can fall into the false assumption that political parties have the real solutions to our problems. Let's say that again. We can fall into the false assumption the political parties have the real solution to our problems, be they Republican or Democrat, conservative or progressive, Fox News or MSNBC, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. But these are not God. They will not save you. They will not last. John reminds us that even with human governmental systems, might I say in our times, especially politics, the ass is already at the root of the tree. Have I mentioned yours yet? What in your life gets the focus of your attention? What do you spend your time, your money, thinking about, pursuing? It's so easy to focus on things other than loving God and loving our neighbor and become short-sighted, losing sight of the big picture, that heavenly perspective. Why? Do we spend so much time and effort investing our lives in the things that God is chopping down? Why are we chasing after eight-track eight track tape players and rotary dial phones? The axe is already at the root of the tree. God is the one who came to, came to save. The Lord Jesus comes to renew us with his spirit and rescue us. He alone is our hope. He alone should direct our lives. Let all the rest be means to the end, but not the end in themselves. Not the course setting, all wise driving force of our lives. All right, so that's some of what John might say to us if he were preaching tonight in the 21st century. But we have to ask, why does Luke say that John's message all this harsh language about God's judgment is good news. Do you see? The good news is that in Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is near. God is coming to set things right. In fact, the Lord is already moving to correct injustices in this world. And also, the good news is that God has sent us, John, the Baptist, to make our hearts ready for the Lord and his coming. Do not mistake it for a moment. He coming he is. The Lord is coming. Paul says it in that other passage I wanted to preach from. Philippians 4, he says, the Lord is near. The Lord is near in that he's about to return. His timing is soon. But that also means that he is near to us. He's already come in the Holy Spirit. You have Jesus near to you this evening. Jesus is just as near to you this evening as he was to John the Baptist in that crowd of the Jordan River. What lasts is what the Lord Jesus is bringing to us. God's love, a relationship with God, a saving relationship that rescues us from the mess we make of things by clinging to such things that are passing away. The mess we make of our lives by pursuing the lesser, temporary things that God is chopping down. The good news is because God is giving us the direction we need, we have what we need from God. He's giving us that direction. Not another person, not a party, nothing in this world. 
God gives us the direction we need. He is showing us what really matters in the universe that he has made. God is directing us to put our attention, our efforts, and focus on the things that will last, to trust our lives into his hands, to pursue the kingdom of God, and live life loving others. The one who dies with the most toys wins, the bumper sticker said a few years ago. Really? Do we want to leave this life clinging to floppy disks, rotary phones, and 8-track tape players? The good news is that God is not leaving us in the dark. He wants us to flourish in this life and into eternity by focusing on what matters most, the things that will last. He's coming. He's near. His spirit is within us. God warns us not to make the means the end, but to have an open heart before him. Be open to God. Jesus said it. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you as well. The book of Proverbs says it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. This is good news for your life because God is showing you this evening the things that really matter, the things that will last. It's as if he's saying to you, he is saying to you this evening, look here, that thing it won't last. It's temporary. Don't get fixated on that. Don't become overly concerned with that problem that's passing away. Instead, he says, listen. Listen to me. Follow me. Show love and compassion to my people. Cultivate a renewed life, a repentant life. That's one that develops a new outlook, focusing on the truth that God is near, focusing life on that truth. Jesus will become visible soon when he returns to earth, but even now, he is nearby, present in the Holy Spirit, bringing the renewal and the peace which passes understanding right into your heart. The good news is that God wants to save you from spending your life in pursuit of floppy disks when he's offering you a fiber optic tree. Well, all right. More than even, more than that, more than even a fiber optic tree, God wants you to know him now and through eternity, as you experience his love and share it with those around you. Some things last, some things don't. Some are even at this moment being cut down as the axe is at the root of the tree. And the good news is that God doesn't want you to waste a single minute pursuing the things that are destined to be incinerated on the rubbish heap of eternity. He wants you to embrace the things that will last. His love and living a life of love, a life filled with his peace which passes understanding, knowing that he is near to you, even in this moment. Lean into him and his renewing spirit and receive the good news. To him be the honor, glory, power, and praise now and forever. Go so now to a time of prayers for the people. And I invite you to feel free to say a name uh, out loud, to say a prayer, um, to make these the prayers of the people. Um, I also do encourage us this evening to remember our prayers, all the victims of those tornadoes in the Midwest. Let us go before the Lord now in prayer. of our hearts this evening, our God. I'm going to pray for uh, Juliana and for Keely and for her entire family. I'm going to pray for us. I'd like to pray for uh, the memory of Anita Gentella and for Beth Gentella and for a full recovery for Frank O'Connor. Mm -hmm.
and for those in our parish family who are battling cancer, bring you in your hearts. Restore our in your strength. Pray also for Bob, who is nearing the end of his life. Lord, hear the prayers of our hearts, those spoken and unspoken. And hear us, Lord, as we confess our sins against you. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and will humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Hear the assurance of God's pardon. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. Peace. 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 Thanks so much for coming out tonight. I uh, have the bulletins there uh, in the back, and as well as week three Advent devotionals, if you would like a hard copy of those, or are being emailed out as well. Um, this is our last intersect service of 2021. Can you believe it? Next Sunday, we do have a service at 5 o'clock, and I hope you will come. It's going to be down in the church. It's going to be lessons and carols, that wonderful tradition. Uh, Christmas tradition, and then we're going to have a reception outside, and we are praying that the weather is just going to be fine. We have the heaters set up and uh, fire pits going, and it should be a wonderful evening. So I hope you can come back next week, but we'll not be intersect. And then the following Sunday will be the 26th of December, the day after Christmas, and I would love to see some of you join the other two people that will probably be with me at the one service we have that day at 10 a.m. Uh, in the church on the 26th of December. Um, Christmas Eve, of course, we have our family service at 4 o'clock, and these musicians are going to be joining in uh, with their guitars at 4 o'clock service, and then a full choir at 8 and 8.30. Uh, the music starts at 8, so this is 8.30, and then so does uh, someone that I think is quite a nice, good soloist, and that's Stephen Wally, baritone, who will be singing at the late service. Um, starts at 11 o'clock. Uh, it is my intention, Lord willing, and technology cooperating, that all three of those services will be live streamed on uh, both Facebook and YouTube. But I'd love to see all of you at uh, the services for Christmas. Thanks for coming out tonight. I'm going to uh, get the communion ready and uh, We'll move to a time of communion. We do that once a month at this service, and this is the time. So, ascribe to the Lord the honor to His name, but not for us. Come to His words through Christ.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks and praise, O God. You send the prophets to warn us. You are coming again, and you have come into our hearts, Lord Jesus Christ, through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came to earth, that you became one of us, that you died our death on the cross, that we might be forgiven and have life in your name. And so we join the saints and angels in proclaiming your glory as we say. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so, Father, we bring you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate the memorial of your Son by means of this holy bread and cup. We show forth the sacrifice of his death and proclaim his resurrection until he comes again. Gather us by this holy communion into one body. In your Son, Jesus Christ, make us a living sacrifice of praise. By him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The vine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. There is the Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Sons 
spiritual food of the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have made us one body in him. We thank you for the blessing of this worship, this time to be together. We give you all the praise and glory in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Final song is Jesus Messiah.
the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God, and the Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day. Remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Thank you for coming.